Okay, well let's get started. Uh, my name is Jordan Layton. I'm a research analyst at the National Alliance on Homelessness. Um, and I appreciate you joining us today for the first in what will be a series of webinars I'm planning for the 2017 Unsheltered Point in Time Counts. And this webinar today, we're going to focus on overall planning and implementation standards and strategies. The National Alliance to End Homelessness is the leading national voice on the issue of homelessness, and the Homelessness Research Institute is the research and education arm of the National Alliance. I want you to be aware that all the lines are muted uh, during the webinar, but if you have any questions, please submit them through the webinar software. There's a uh, chat box labeled uh, questions on your webinar control panel. And if you have questions that are intended for uh, one presenter in particular, please indicate that with your question. Uh, we're going to have some time at the end to go through some questions and answers. Uh, it's likely we don't get through all of them, but we'll, we'll get to as many as we can. And then also be aware that this webinar is going to be posted on the Alliance's website uh, as soon as we can get it there. So we have here uh, today, uh, first, William Snow from the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, who will discuss federal government guide, guidance and standards. Second, Shira Folks from the Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, Florida Continuum of Care will provide one example of a community's unsheltered count. Third, Amanda Sisson from the West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness will provide another example. Finally, at the end we'll have, like I said, some time for questions and answers. answers. There's one thing um, before I turn it over to William. Um, as he'll certainly uh, touch on, the 2017 point in time count is going to be the baseline year for using point-in-time data and measuring progress towards ending youth homelessness. So it's critical that the 2017 point-in-time count produce a quality baseline. Away Home America is working with a variety of partners, including the Alliance, to ensure that this is possible, and that CSCs and runaway and homeless youth providers work together to identify youth uh, who meet HUD's definition for the count. And there's going to be a number of resources coming out this fall, particularly throughout October, to help communities achieve the best youth count possible. So for example, uh, we at the Alliance are going to hold another webinar in October focusing on uh, counting homeless youth, most likely during the week of October 10th. Uh, the True Colors Fund will host a Google Hangout to discuss their point in time count toolkit, uh, most likely on October 18th. Uh, National Network for Youth. Uh, we'll also hold a webinar, uh, Voices of Youth Count will release a toolkit, and finally HUD will release a document they're developing on best practices. So uh, keep your eye out for these, get connected to these uh, initiatives um, because there's going to be a lot of uh, support and resources to help you uh, have a solid youth count. Okay, so first let's uh, turn it over to our first presenter who is William Snow. Um, from HUD. All right, thanks, Jordan. I'm excited to be here. We are coming up fast on this next count. It's uh, 2017 is not that far away, so we're very uh, thrilled to see that it's coming and excited to see the results that will come from it as well. Uh, I want to thank the National Alliance for putting on this and other webinars. They're very, very helpful. And so hopefully uh, hopefully you're able to take from it and be prepared for the count. So I'm just going to cover a few basics, and then uh, we're excited to hear from the communities who are on the phone today. Uh, the HIC, or the Housing Inventory Count, and the Point in Time Count, or the PIT Count, are done in conjunction. The Housing Inventory Count is um, an inventory of beds and units dedicated to serve persons who are experiencing homelessness. At the same time that the HIC count is, or the HIC data is collected, the point in time count is conducted, and that is where communities collect data on the number of persons and their characteristics who are experiencing homelessness at a point in time. So 
for a quick overview, communities are responsible through their continuums of care to conduct a point in time count at least biennially or every other year uh, of homeless persons within their geographic area. The pit count has two core pieces, the sheltered count and the unsheltered count. We're going to focus on the unsheltered count uh, here in this call today. So two core methods that are used or two core principles of collecting the data are using a census-based approach. And that's more or less where communities go out and count in the entire geographic area. They more or less uh, walk the pavements of the entire geography. An alternative method is using sampling techniques to derive the estimate for the community. Um, one of the key things that's important for communities to remember is that the expectation is that the communities have a count that's representative of the entire geography. So that uh, hasn't always been clear in the past, but we want to make sure continuums of care cover everything. So the most vivid examples, there are some communities that do known location counts, which is fine. That's counting in uh, where communities know homeless people congregate. And that is certainly an acceptable standard. Uh, but when counts like that or other types of counts, it could be random sample or uh, census-based counts are done, CFC still need to make sure all the counties or sub-jurisdictions are covered in their geography. Um, so sometimes there's some confusion about that. If there's a reason to exclude areas, I think the most obvious example is a place like Alaska. There are a lot of places to exclude in Alaska. Uh, if there's reason to exclude the area from the estimate altogether, uh, we ask that you document that in the application, the continuum of care application process. And we uh, are in the process of looking at those now, actually. So just kind of a little deeper dive into unsheltered methodologies. We have kind of two main pieces. There's a, or options, and that's a night of the count approach and a service-based approach. So a night of the count is essentially using a single night or possibly uh, one or two nights and covering the entire geographic area. Or if you choose a known location, you can choose that. Or the alter other alternative is choosing uh, random sites and then extrapolating uh, for those areas that the community was not able to count in. And Night of the Count is really based on a deduplication strategy of trying to count homeless persons during hours where they wouldn't be moving a lot. Uh, often there are different techniques for doing that. You can do an observation or you can do interviews. Um, so those are key components of doing unsheltered counting. How you decide what you do depends on several factors, but obviously resources is a big, uh, big one. That could be resources in terms of money, uh, certainly in terms of volunteers, could be in terms of expertise. Um, looking at geographic size is important. In most rural areas, we tend to see a random sample approach because it's just almost impossible to cover the entire area. Uh, in many larger cities, we're starting to see more and more census-based approaches uh, where there's a big volunteer effort to go and count on all streets. So those are the main methodologies for unsheltered counting. I want to quickly go over the changes that we issued in our notice uh, in August of this year. We're really excited to get the notice out early. That's been a request from communities for years. Uh, I wish I could promise it will always be out in the summertime. That will be our goal. Um, but we were excited to see it happen for the 2017 standards. Uh, we just have a few changes, actually. So in the housing inventory count, we're not requiring to communities to report on DEM projects. Those are the rapid rehousing um, demonstration projects that were funded in 2008. There were only 23 of them. Uh, and almost all of them have converted now to rapid rehousing. So there's no need for a separate uh, project type. So we've removed it. Uh, we've expanded the McKinney-Vento funding piece, which uh, looks not only at yes or no anymore, which is what we did in the past, but looks at the categories that align in the HMIS data standards. You know, was it ESG funded or COC funded, et cetera. Uh, the grant per diem program funded by the VA has traditionally been transitional housing. Uh, that's what it's funded for. That's how Congress sees it. They have uh, over 12,000 
beds are, trans are the grant per diem beds. It's a lot of beds. The VA has, in the past couple of years, been able to get approval um, to give some projects the flexibility to do transition in place projects. You communities that have that, they have to get VA approval to do it. So there's only a limited, there's only a couple hundred beds at this point in time that are transition in place beds. So where that approval has been given by the VA, we ask that communities that have that reflect those transition in place GPD beds as other permanent housing as opposed to transitional housing. Uh, we also wanted to make sure when uh, communities are reporting youth dedicated beds that they're not just reporting on unaccompanied youth dedicated beds but any beds uh, that are dedicated to youth including beds for parenting youth uh, and dedicated beds would include beds used both for the, the youth themselves as well as their children in that case and then finally we collapsed two separate fields that we used to have um, the TH unit type and the scattered field site um, into a single category called housing type. They were more or less collecting the same thing, uh, so we wanted to just ask communities this, the question once. All right, in the point in time counts, even fewer changes. So we're still trying to figure out the best way to capture data on gender identity. And so um, we, this year, added one additional category. So you're asking about male, female, transgender, and then this other category, which is don't identify as male, female or transgender. We just want to make sure we have the opportunity for all gender identities to be captured in one way or another. And so that's uh, recognizing that aspect. Um, for reporting chronic homelessness, we were trying to figure out the most appropriate way to collect on chronic homelessness. And we found that adding it to the existing household type uh, tab in the HDX made the most sense. And so we're going to be collecting chronic homeless status by household type. And um, that way, again, we're hoping we get information about uh, the various type of chronic homeless experiences across household types. And finally, there have been questions about who you count as chronically homeless. Uh, do you count all members of a family or household where there's a person who's chronically homeless? Or do you only count those who are qualifying under the definition? Uh, we ask that you count everybody in a household who where at least one person identifies as chronically homeless. All right. As mentioned by Jordan as we began the call, 2017 is a big year for, uh, for counting homeless youth. We've seen great progress in communities. We want to recognize the progress you guys have made. We've seen some very innovative practices and some good work. We're at a point where we feel uh, confident enough to start using uh, or wanting to start use, using trend data for youth information. And so because of data quality questions that we've had, we're not going to use generally data prior to 2017, but, uh, but we'll start drawing uh, trend lines and running analyses on youth-specific data from the point in time count using 2017 as the baseline year. It's important to highlight here that there are a lot of different sources of data on homeless youth. We certainly don't want to uh, tell you to negate those other sources. They're very important, especially the Department of Education data. So we would like to uh, be clear that we expect the point time count data to be just one of many data sources communities look to when they're trying to understand the best way to serve their youth and to figure out how many youth that there are in their community who are experiencing various levels of homelessness. So. When we talk about the pit counts, the 2017 being the baseline year for the pit count for youth, we don't mean we will never look at any other data sources, but what we mean is when we're looking to compare progress towards youth in the context of the pit count, we're going to use 2017 as that uh, beginning year. So we wanted to, to make that clear as well. Uh, we'll publish other resources later during the year. One of the things that I want to just highlight quickly is the most success we've seen in communities, the best practices, really aren't so much on the night of the count itself, but are on uh, all the planning and preparation that goes into the count. It's getting the right people at the table, getting your youth providers at the table, getting youth themselves at the table, uh, getting schools at the table, 
and others, especially um, child welfare and other agencies involved. But it's about that early and often inter, uh, interaction that allows the pit count to be successful. So we will, uh, we will publish a few resources in October to help kind of coordinate some information we have about youth, but we'd certainly encourage you, look at other resources. There are fabulous resources that are coming out um, from Voices of Youth, from Chapin Hall, the National Network for Youth are doing some work on it, uh, True Colors, things that Jordan mentioned early on. Look at all the information that's out there. The HUD standard tends to be more limited. Uh, so when reporting to HUD for the purposes of the 2017 pit count, you may have a more limited focus on what gets reported. But in your data collection efforts, you can certainly be more expansive. You can collect on broader audiences uh, like Doubled Up. That's certainly acceptable. You won't include that in what you provide to us. But that is invaluable information for you to understand where uh, youth who present for services or that you find on the night of the point in time count, where they're residing. So we certainly encourage communities to use the various methods of collecting data to their fullest and get the most information they can, and then to use that data to improve how they serve youth and other communities or other populations as well. So we have several resources that are available now. Uh, our primary site is our Pit and Hit Guides tools and webinars site. Uh, almost everything is available there, our current notice, our, our Pit Count Methodology Guide. We have various tools on both surveying and on implementation, including our extrapolation tool. Uh, we are going to update our current model survey to include the latest standards, and we're going to do a separate use-specific survey that will have some questions that are beyond the normal scope of the pit count, but they're common questions that, uh, that communities have asked for, so we'd like to give that to you. Um, I think that covers the majority of what we want to do, so I'm excited to, uh, to hear from the other communities on the phone. Thanks, William. Um, those of you who have sent questions in, I'm keeping track of those, and we'll get to, to some of them here at the end, but let's uh, turn it over now to Shira folks from Fort Lauderdale, Broward County. Hi, Jordan. Thank you um, for the opportunity. And my name, like he said, is Shira Folks. I am from Broward County, and I'll be going over the methodology that we use um, here in South Florida. So our whole process, we basically break it down into five phases. Um, phase one is the investigate and define phase. Phase two is the engage and delegate phase. Phase three is the mobilize and energize phase. Phase four is the activate and collect phase, and phase five is the analyze and report phase. Um, I won't be going over each component for the various phases, but I will touch on some of the major objectives and tasks from each. So in phase one, um, we have the PIT committee structure. So the steering and logistics committee is composed of the committee chairs from each of our five uh, subcommittees which include the data processing in HMIS committee, public communication committee, volunteer recruitment and training committee, the unsheltered logistics committee, and the sheltered logistics committee. As far as our timeline, we usually begin our planning in September um, with our kickoff, which is actually for us for the 2017 um, count. Uh, we have our kickoff next week. Um, and at that point, we have the uh, individuals that have showed up to the kickoff, they sign up for their committees, um, and they are given their committee schedule um, for their meetings and the responsibilities for that committee that they are a part of. In October, we usually begin collecting our point location data. Um, we work with the task force, um, the outreach task force for the county as well as the a local sheriff's office and the other municipalities. Um, they allow their officers to enter data into our GIS system, which I'll get in uh, a little more detail later. In November, we really start um, gearing up the volunteer recruitment. In December, we begin uh, soliciting donations. In January, we have our training and, of course, the count. And in February, we start our data entry and data analysis. 
Uh, so from September through January, we typically have uh, two um, two steering and logistics meetings. So we have them biweekly, and then the subcommittees meet one to two times each month or more if needed. So typically for the unsheltered logistics committee um, in December and January, they might meet a few more times just to uh, make sure that they're on track with their responsibilities. So in regards to the unsheltered count methodology based on the HUD approved methodology, we use a combination of the complete coverage, known location, and non-shelter services. Um, so we do cover our entire county with the exception of the portion that's covered by the Everglades. Um, we do um, known locations. So again, uh, speaking to the outreach team and the law enforcement officers that give us the point locations, we also send volunteers out to areas that we haven't mapped out um, in order to make sure that we've um, really covered the whole county. And we also target the non-shelter service like the soup kitchens, um, in particular, some church services, um, health care clinics that cater to the homeless, and um, parks and other places like that. So one of the biggest things that we do is engage the public. Um, when I first started doing the count, this is my fourth count coming up. So in 2014, um, I developed the Broward County Point in Time website. And so there I have information for anybody that's interested about the point in time count, what it is, how you can get involved, uh, resources, um, our publications. So I have the reports from the past few years and ways to contact um, me. I also have links to our Facebook and Twitter pages. Um, and I also have the hashtag Broward Pitt. So basically, um, as we start gearing up, we market our point in time count by using the Broward Pit hashtag in our social media so that people are able to follow um, anything that's related to the Broward point in time count. Some of our partners in the count include the Broward Sheriff's Office, um, who uh, is probably one of the most vocal as far as social media with getting information out about the point in time count. Each year they've uh, done press releases and posted on their social media about the count. We've also had um, some of the local newspapers uh, publicize about the count, as well as local blogs um, put out information about our efforts and ways to get involved. Uh, this past year, we had the opportunity to develop a volunteer registration site. So I worked with a programmer um, to develop this website. It, allowed the volunteer to enter their contact information. We verified that they were 18 or older. Mm -hmm. They were able to sign a confidentiality agreement. Um, they were able to consent to whether or not they want to allow their photo to be taken. Um, they di disclosed whether or not they had participated in a previous count. And then they were able to volunteer, um, they were able to register for the volunteer training and their pit shift. Um, if you were interested in going out as a team with some of your coworkers or friends or classmates, you were able to list their names and we also gathered information on whether or not they were willing to drive. Um, so on this website, uh, we had 272 volunteers that registered and 238 that registered for training. Um, one of the benefits of having the complete um, autonomy with the website was that on the back end for the administration, um, we were able to see exactly what volunteer registered for what shift and um, all their information. So I was actually able to communicate with volunteers through this website um, to send them reminders about their training and their pitch shift. And on the uh, prior to the count, I was able to give our site captain the rosters that included all of the volunteer information. So they had um, each shift broken down in what volunteers were available and which volunteers were able to drive for those shifts. So they knew if they had a need for a driver from their location or if they were going to be covered for drivers and if they would need staff to fill in if there weren't enough volunteers to participate for that particular shift. 
So the mapping system, um, we worked really closely with our county GIS um, uh, mapping group. And so they developed a system for us that included data on the location, the type of site. So we looked at food distribution sites, gathering places, day sites, day labor sites, and shelters. Um, we were able to put in information about the number of in individuals at each site and we were able to put in the best time of day. So that helped us with logistics um, as far as pinpointing when we would be sending volunteers to the specific sites. The left picture um, shows the larger wall map that were developed for each of the three regions that we have in Broward County, North, Central, and South. The wall maps were provided to the site captains to give them an overall view of how many uh, point locations we had in the areas that we knew we had point locations, which you see in the yellow, and then all the other places were areas that we didn't have point locations, but oftentimes they would send uh, groups to those areas just to make sure that we didn't miss anybody. The map on the right is the smaller map that were um, given to our volunteers. These maps were given to the volunteers with a route listing, and so each point location has a number, and each number had a corresponding exact address with the information that was recorded in the GIS system online. So they were able to get an exact um, location and know if they needed to send a large group of volunteers to that location, if it was a, a food distribution site, or if they only needed to send one team of three or four people because it was a kind of a scattered location. The volunteer training, all volunteers were required to go through a training uh, with the exception of individuals who had participated within the past two years. They were able to opt out of an in-person training. Um, we had on-site trainings for um, each of the regions, but we also um, gave organizations within the continuum the opportunity to have myself or one of the other trainers come out if they had 10 or more participants that um, wanted to participate in the count. So we would actually do individualized trainings. And after all of the trainings were finished, I provided everybody with an online refresher training um, a week prior to the count so they would uh, just be able to familiarize themselves whenever they um, uh, were able to with the whole process and it goes over the survey tool and some of the ways that you can approach um, individuals um, while they're out counting. Volunteer visibility. So each of the years that I've been doing the count, I've developed a t-shirt to make us um, stand out while we're out counting. Uh, for the first few years we had yellow shirts and this past year we had a lime green shirt. Um, so it would make us not only visible to those that we were trying to interview, but also so people would know who their teammates were. Um, we had the fortune of having a photographer volunteer for the past three years to go out, and we would have those that um, we would interview, they would sign the consent, and he would photograph, and it would be like a photojournalism for our continuum, um, which I would present during the volunteer uh, appreciation luncheon that we have every year after the count. So community participation, um, we had 11 law enforcement agencies participate with over 100 officers this past year. Um, these officers, for the most majority of them were trained in crisis intervention, um, which is a 40-hour training program for law enforcement to give them the tools necessary to respond appropriately to vulnerable populations such as the homeless. Um, these officers were a huge help to us. Um, in addition to the staff that may have come out to help count from the shelters, these officers are very familiar with the homeless population in Broward County. And so a lot of them already have a rapport with the individuals that they were um, counting. And it made it a lot easier for the individuals to, um, it made it a lot easier for the individuals to feel comfortable answering the survey and answering it honestly. Um, we also had participation in relationships with um, two of our major universities down here, Barry University and Nova Southeastern, and a total of 29 community agencies, organizations, and universities participated. So as far as outreach during the count, 
Um, one thing that we have been doing for the past few years is um, giving out the consumer flyer. So probably starting the very beginning of January, we start distributing the consumer flyer to different agencies that um, provide services to those experiencing homelessness. And it's just a way for them to know that you know, there will be some individuals that might approach you in the coming weeks um, with a green shirt on to ask you a few questions. And if you participate, we'll give you incentives. Um, the incentives this past year were a hygiene kit and round trip bus pass um, for each person that participated. Um, they also received a homeless resource guide, so they knew some of the services that were available to them in uh, Broward County. And also, uh, each volunteer received a homeless count volunteer checklist. And a part of that checklist is the veteran contact information. Um, so basically, if somebody was out interviewing an individual and, and they found out that that individual was a veteran, they were able to call one of the two contacts and the person would immediately come to that location and provide um, outreach to that individual. And at that point, they would be able to determine if they qualified for specific services. So just to give you an idea of what our regional headquarters look like, again, like I said, we had three regions for Broward County, North, Central, and South. And in each one, we had a site captain who managed the distribution of volunteers. They communicate with the coordinator, and they communicate with the volunteer liaison. The volunteer liaison communicates directly with the volunteers. They distributed the t-shirts. They were responsible for the volunteer sign-in, and they were responsible for distributing the volunteer um, bags, which contained the hygiene kits for those who we interviewed. And then we had a person that was responsible for quality assurance. Um, that individual was responsible for checking the surveys when they were returned, and they dismissed the volunteers once they uh, checked the volunteers to make sure that all the questions that uh, had been answered. Um, the quality assurance person was new this year, and it was really successful. Um, we wanted to make sure that one of our goals was to continue to improve on the data quality um, because we know how important it is for um, the HUD report. So we made sure that each location had somebody that could check the surveys to make sure that all the vital information was captured. Um, at the end of the whole process, we recognize our volunteers and we have a process debrief to go over um, everything from the beginning of the process through the count. Um, the volunteer appreciation luncheon has always been a big hit. Um, like I said, we show them all the pictures that were taken during the count. Um, we hand out certificates, and they get a free lunch. So everybody always um, enjoys that. The process debrief goes over all the successes and the opportunities for improvement. And um, we also go over the results from the volunteer and committee member surveys. Um, every year, we uh, distribute surveys, satisfaction surveys, to get feedback on what we could improve on, um, what went well, what didn't go so well, how the training was. So we just uh, really want to engage them to find out how the process could continue to um, grow. Some of the opportunities for improvement that we found um, is having a backup headquarters in case of an emergency. Um, this year we actually had the misfortune of getting uh, hit by an actual tornado during the second day of our count. Um, and so one of our uh, regional headquarters was actually shut down for half of a day. Um, so we didn't have access to that center because it was a one, one road access and there was a, a tree that went down. And so we weren't able to have any volunteers leave or go into that site. Um, so it would be important for us to establish a backup headquarters in case something else like that happens. Hopefully it doesn't. Um, we also want to focus on strategizing shifts to target meal site times. One of the things that happened um, this past year was um, we would kind of base all the meal site um, location times on shifts that were more relevant for one specific region. And so, for example, one of the uh, meal sites in the central region was open at 11, but there weren't any um, meal sites for the north and south regions at 11. And so some of the volunteers that signed up for that shift in the other two regions were kind of just waiting around until noon. And so they kind of felt like their time wasn't utilized um, as well as it could have been. 
We also want to look at capping the number of volunteers for certain shifts and regions. A lot of times people choose the shifts and regions based on what's most convenient for them, but it's usually kind of heavy on the after five um, time slot in the central region because that's where most of our population lives. And so a lot of times we end up having a huge number of volunteers for one region and not enough for the other two. So that's my whole presentation. Thank you again for having me. My name is Shire Folks, and my contact information is here. Um, and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. That was excellent. Let's turn our uh, attention over to Amanda from West Virginia. Amanda, take it away. Um, thank you, Jordan, um, for the invitation to present today. Uh, like Jordan said, my name is Amanda Sisson. I'm the Assistant Director with the West Virginia Coalition to End Homelessness. I'm going to talk to you today about how we go about our PIP count on an annual basis and specifically with a rural focus um, on our PIP count because we are a very rural, very large uh, geography. This is, in fact, our geography um, and a little bit about who we are. We're the State Coalition uh, to End Homelessness in West Virginia. We're also the balance of state continuum of care, which is the geography that encompasses about 44, well, it is 44 of West Virginia's 55 counties. We're also the HMIS lead for the balance of state. We're also the SOAR state lead. We also do ESG rapid rehousing and path street outreach in 22 of West Virginia's 55 counties. And um, our motto is that we believe in being cool, we believe in housing first, we believe in failing and improving. So here's my... Um, my little soapbox on the PIT as we move forward this year into 2017. And we believe that if, uh, the C if your COC is doing outreach, doing prioritization, and utilizing a by name list on an annual basis, then the PIT should be a very simple activity for you. You've uh, already engaged everyone who is homeless through your COC, and you know who they are by name, and you're prioritizing them for housing resources on an ongoing basis. So your outreach, either your PATH outreach, your SSBF, or ESG in collaboration with the VA should be finding people on a regular basis throughout the year who are experiencing homelessness and feeding them to your by name list. Therefore, when the PIT comes around, you should simply be able to pull and examine your by name list, follow up with your communities or your county contacts in each community to verify the accuracy of the list, and then you'll ultimately know who is unsheltered in your PIT. So that's my little soapbox on <laughs> as we move forward into the PIT in 2017. So I made that sound really simple, right? Well, nevertheless, when you tackle an unsheltered count, there are inevitably some unique, and I don't really like the word unique, but there are some unique challenges that rural communities face. And uh, they center around geography. Uh, in West Virginia, our la landscape is predominantly rural, uh, countrysides, wooded areas, and it makes finding people very difficult sometimes impossible. Um, the area that we cover is 44 counties, so it takes about four hours to get from the top of our COC to the bottom of our COC, so driving uh, and traversing the COC on one night is not really possible. Um, a lot of people uh, just don't believe that there are people who are homeless in their communities because they're invisible and they're living in abandoned buildings and they're under bridges and they're out of sight. And this only, not only makes serving people very difficult, but it makes reducing the stigma very challenging as well. And as mentioned above, the needs and programs established to meet those needs vary so much from county to county. It makes collecting data on the night of the point in time count in a uniform way very difficult. So planning for our PIT, we use a combination of all uh, HUD-approved methodologies. We use service-based counts. We use HMIS for our sheltered count. We do complete coverage. We look in known locations. And then in the past year, in 2016, we're also examining our by name list data to complete an accurate point-in-time count. So we determine our methodologies. We design our survey instruments. We train our communities. We use HMIS, and we analyze after the count, of course. So I'll talk about how we train our communities later, but we really start training um, in December. And we rely heavily on HMIS for our accurate reporting, especially since we're so rural and diverse. 
So CSC should start thinking about the PIT in the early fall. As we heard Shira say, they've already started their planning um, process in Broward County. We uh, usually set our date no later than October 1st, so we'll be publicizing our date within the next couple weeks. And then we start training and we garner support from our usual communities that usually participate with us. We require our COC and our ESG funded projects to participate, so we really encourage those programs to lead the charge in their communities. Uh, we review the HUD PIT guidance, which was very helpful that it came out so early this year, so thank you HUD for sending that out so early. Uh, we also plan for our COC staff to be on site across the COC during the point in time count. We have uh, six uh, COC staff that are able to go out and be on site. And of course, we put our direct service staff uh, from the coalition on site in various locations throughout our COC on the night of the point in time count. We try to have care packages and encourage communities to get donations for care packages and incentives, not only for the people that we're surveying, but also for our volunteers. We've done gas cards. Uh, we've done meal tickets. Uh, we've done um, care packages, hygiene products, uh, food, blankets, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, because we are in a rural COC, we have to have a contingency plan and we have to have an alternative date. Last year, in 2016, winter storm Jonas hit the East Coast. We actually had 33 inches of snow, and I was snowed in at home. So we could not leave our um, offices, and we could not conduct the count as we had anticipated. So we moved the date back a couple days, uh, or we anticipated moving the date back a couple days. But with the amount of snow that we got, that was really impossible. So we petitioned HUD, and we picked an alternative date, and we actually moved it back just one week later. We had a lot of support from our community. So we were able to get HUD approval to move the count back simply one week so that we didn't lose our volunteer basis across the entire COC. So always having a contingency plan, especially in a rural area, is very important. So our data collection methods, of course, for our sheltered uh, data collection, we use emergency shelters. We look at uh, programs and churches that are offering hotel motel vouchers on a regular basis. We're looking at transitional housing programs, supportive housing programs, and of course we look at HMIS. We have a pretty good coverage rate for our HMIS across our COC, so that's a positive for us that we're able to re really rely on HMIS for the majority of our sheltered data. And then we can focus on getting our providers to actually go out and do an unsheltered count since they're not uh, not typically doing a sheltered survey with the people who are in their shelter because they're already using HMIS. So for the unsheltered, like I said before, we use a street count, we use public places counts, we encourage providers to do outreach events and service-based counts, and we do any combination of any of the above things, and some communities are doing multiple events to draw people in. So who do, who do we involve? Of course, I mentioned before, we use our COC funded and our ESG funded programs. We involve churches, we involve our outreach workers across the COC. We have a Department of Health and Human uh, Services office in uh, every county, so we really focus on uh, engaging those providers. That's In most counties in rural West Virginia, the DHHR office or Department of Human Services office is the one service provider in the community. It might be the only service provider in the community. There may not be a shelter and there may not be um, you know, a drop-in center or anything like that. So we really engage those departments to uh, conduct service-based screenings uh, during the point in time count. Free clinics, colleges, universities, obviously for volunteers. Uh, family resource networks. We have a family resource network um, within the state and there's an office in every county as well. Our coordinated entry sites, of course, that's where people are going to seek services. Our HMIS lead, which happens to be us. State park officials, because people are camping in state parks, uh, often in campgrounds and along rivers. And then our McKinney Vento homeless education liaison. So we're really looking to enhance our relationships with our homeless ed liaisons to get a better count of youth homelessness in 2017. We've historically not had a very good working relationship or much communication at all from many of our education liaisons, 
most often in West Virginia, the homeless ed liaison plays dual roles within their school districts. So they may often be the liaison, but also the attendance director and maybe even the transportation director all wrapped into one position. So they're very busy people, and it's been kind of a challenge to engage them and to impart the importance of the PIT in, in counting youth homelessness. So we're looking to foster that relationship as we move forward into 2017. So where do we find people who are unsheltered in rural areas? Uh, of course, we find them in soup kitchens and truck stops, and I mentioned national forests and campgrounds. Uh, we look in all-night diners and coffee shops and libraries, abandoned buildings, rest areas. The Walmart parking lot is always a good one because you can camp there. Um, local fire police and EMS departments also usually know where people are staying. So people in rural areas may only be able to go into town once a week. So we allow providers to continue surveying individuals and families through the end of January. So they reference the night of the count. We usually pick uh, the first Tuesday um, that falls within the last 10 days of January. So we really encourage uh, for service-based counting as people are coming in through the end of January, we allow our providers to continue to survey people and referencing back to the night of the point in time count. And that's that's really boosted the amount of data that we're able to collect because some people, again, may only be able to go into town once a week or get a ride um, to a, a service provider on a specific day of the week. So we found that the ideal time uh, to find people is between the hours of about 4 a.m. and 7 a.m and between about 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. So we've discovered this through doing the 100,000 Homes Campaign Registry Week in the past. So uh, finding people earlier in the morning is usually uh, their most sober time of the day, especially for chronically homeless people who drink or use drugs. So the early morning hours are when they're starting to get up, and they're usually the most sober. Um, in the evening, um, it's when people are starting to kind of hunker down for the night. We don't spend a lot of time surveying on the streets throughout the day on the night of, on the day of the point in time count. That's mostly dedicated for our service-based counting. So we encourage um, communities to uh, designate teams. We most often have a uh, community organizer who organizes their volunteers into teams. They have maps of who and which team is going where in each community. And again, uh, they carry care packages. They carry flashlights, cell phones, and sorry we missed you cards. Sorry we missed you cards. I'll touch on that for a minute. Um, we have our outreach teams that actually carry Sorry We Missed You cards as well. But if you find a place that looks like someone was staying, you can drop a card, log the location, and then either send another team back later, or the person would then have your contact information um, to reach you for services if they so choose. So that's, that's been helpful, especially in our outreach services, the Sorry We Missed You cards. So developing our survey tools, uh, we use the HUD guidance. Uh, last year in 2016, we used the VI SPDAT because it is our common assessment tool for coordinated entry. So what we wanted to do was really uh, survey people who had not been um, fed to our by name list yet and were not already uh, outreach to. So we incorporated the PIT and numerator questions into the VI SPDAT. So for the unsheltered count, we used the VI SPDAT survey tool. For the sheltered count, we used HMIS. And then for non-HMIS providers, we use a bed tally sheet, a housing inventory count bed tally sheet that logs the number of beds that are in use on the night of the count. And then we ask that they attach the survey as well for the people who are using those beds. So this is an overview of what um, a screenshot of our, our survey tool last year. And we do include the HMIS release of information. So everyone who's encountered uh, through the unsheltered count and completes a survey and consents for HMIS has their survey entered into HMIS. So they may have been encountered on the street through a volunteer, but that survey is then fed to a uh, local provider, usually our COC-funded folks or our ESG-funded folks who are organizing the count in the community. And those people put, um, put the surveys into HMIS um, through the PIT workflow, and we're able to pull the unsheltered count down out of HMIS as well. So here's another look um, at page two of our survey form. So we're collecting data on the minor children. And then um, it pops into the VI SPDAT uh, 2.0 uh, questions. You can find the full forms on our website. The link is there at the bottom of the screen. 
Okay, so the HIC non-HMIS bed, bed tally sheet. So beds and units that are identified on the bed count tally sheet must be dedicated, obviously, to serving people who are experiencing homelessness. And what we do is we take this bed tally sheet and we set up a temporary site in HMIS for the surveys for the purpose of the sheltered count. So if a provider is not using HMIS, we set up a te temporary site to get the data down and then we remove the site and we remove the surveys. The bed tally sheet gets turned in with the PIT surveys attached and that's for any missions that are not using HMIS, any seasonal shelters not using it, HUD bash, uh, CWT programs, hotel, motel vouchers. Um, I will touch briefly that DV providers and NRCOC, they return a paper bed tally sheet along with anonymous surveys and they're not entered into HMIS. So here's what our HIC bed tally sheet looks like. So we look at the actual uh, beds by project type and how many total beds for singles, how many total beds for families, and total units for families. So we look at the total number of units that the project has, and then the back page of this form uh, logs the number of people who are actually in those units, and then the provider attaches the corresponding surveys. So again, this full form can also be found on our website under the PIT portion of our website. So I'll talk briefly about training. So train, train, train. Um, we have coordinator training. We have volunteer training um, for the coordinators to use. Uh, and we do HMIS training to make sure that all of the data within HMIS for the night of the point in time count is accurate and recorded correctly so that it will then feed to uh, the sheltered count coming out of our HMIS software. So we designate a community organizer as the point of contact uh, to the COC. So uh, with our geography being so varied, uh, 44 counties, we can't obviously be out counting in every single county or be um, helping in every single county. So we rely heavily on community organizers in each county or in a, you know, a group of counties who really serves as our point of contact and is, our, is responsible for training their volunteers to conduct the count in their area. So they're trained by the COC, and then they in turn train their community volunteers. So we pre-record and post the volunteer training on our website, and uh, we do that via GoToWebinar. So our volunteers in each community can go watch the training remotely, and then we provide each community organizer with a list of attendees for uh, the training. They're, therefore, they know who's been trained in their community, and then they're prepped and ready to go out to do the PIT. So we provide sample forms to our communities, we provide sample press releases, flyers, law enforcement and business notifications, and we provide talking points guides as well. All of those documents can also be found on our website if you want to pull those down and use them. You're welcome to do so. And as I mentioned early, we go out and we engage communities that have not historically been involved in the point in time count. So we try to get on the ground with a new community every year, or at least get one of our staff on the ground somewhere in the COC, and it does involve um, us traveling in most uh, cases. Okay, so as I said earlier, clients get entered into HMIS because we have the HMIS release of information built into our survey tool. So we have lots of preparation for, for our end users. We start um, posting on our agency news within HMIS a couple months before the point in time count, getting users prepped, um, pointing them to the trainings, and um, the sheltered count solely occurs within HMIS um, with the exception of our DV providers. The unsheltered surveys get entered into HMIS. They feed to the by name list, and they also feed to the sheltered uh, PIT report coming out of HMIS. So after the count, again, like I said, we incorporate our efforts into our by name list, and we incorporate our by name list into our PIT count efforts. So everything gets pulled from HMIS. We cross-reference our surveys with our existing by name list data for duplication purposes and deduplication de pur purposes. We set a date for communities to return the surveys or for them to input them into HMIS. So that if they're going to return them to the coalition, we have a date that they have to get them to. And we rely heavily on those county organizers and points of contact to really be the, the person who returns those surveys to the coalition. And we know who we can contact in each community to then uh, rectify any problems. 
So what do we do if we don't get data? Um, as William had said earlier, um, we really want to have a complete coverage for the point in time count, and we really have to look at the counties um, that's in our COC. If there's no data that's received, what do we do? So um, we examine the by name list, list data for that specific county, and if none exists, then we make an assumption based on a formula. So here's an example of what we've done in the past. So uh, there's a county called Ritchie County. It has a population of 10,449 people. Um, comparison to a county that has a population of 11,937 people, which is Grant County. So we take the population of our non-reporting county, we divide it by the population of our reporting county to get a variance in the population, and then we multiply that variance by the county that reported data. So um, you know, if the variance is one, we multiply it by the number that was reported in Grant County, maybe 12, and then we report 12 for Ritchie County as well. So we really, um, we, we tell communities this is how we do it, and in our training we ask communities, does this seem reliable to you, and do you really want your data reported this way? And that's really been um, a good question to ask to get people more involved because they don't want their data to be reported um, as an estimation for their community. So it's really led to uh, more coverage in the, in the past year, so much so that we had um, almost our entire geography covered uh, by a organized point in time count in 2016. So we actually only extrapolated two of these counties or made estimates on two of these counties. We estimated Logan County, which is down in the southern part of the state. Um, Logan had uh, permanent supportive housing and had historically done a point in time count, but nothing was done in 2016 because their permanent supportive housing was actually defunded. Um, through the COC, and the same goes for Mercer County. So Mercer County historically had done a point in time count. Um, they had transitional housing that was defunded through the COC. So we uh, made estimations for those two counties. After an examination of by name list data for the other red counties in our COC, we did not find that there was anybody experiencing homelessness on the night of the point in time count in those, uh, in those counties. So here's our results from 2016. I thought you might find that interesting. Um, and a, the graph shows a comparison of beds to people. So um, how many beds of each housing type did we have and how many people did we have utilizing those beds on the night of the point in time count? We use this data throughout the year as we're going out into communities, as we're talking and providing technical assistance across the COC. And when we hear um, communities say, what we need is another emergency shelter, we can say, well, actually, no, we really don't because we have, you know, a lot of empty beds in emergency shelter on the night of the point in time count, you know, over over 200 empty beds on the night of the point in time count. So last year we counted uh, 84 people unsheltered in the COC, and it seems like um, not a lot, but it's a lot to us. Um, our state only has 1.8 million people in it, and 84 people on any given night are experiencing homelessness, and that's not acceptable to us. So um, there's my contact information. That's, that's my presentation. And thank you for having me today. If you have any questions, you're welcome to send me an email. All right, thanks, Amanda. Um, that was excellent. Let's give you a break for a second and, uh, and ask William a couple questions that came through. Um, William, you still there? We've got a couple clarifying questions for you. Um, the first on the frequency of required sheltered and unsheltered counts. Yep, great and, question. And that being every year or every other year or in some cases every year. And then the other thing is a clarification on what you mean by service-based. Yes. So um, we require the sheltered count every year. It's done in conjunction with the housing inventory count. Um, so that's those two are tied together. So you do do a sheltered count every year. The unsheltered count is only required every other year. Uh, we strongly encourage communities to do an unsheltered count every year. It makes a big difference, especially as you're looking at trends towards uh, meeting 
the opening doors goals and your other local goals. So we certainly have a strong emphasis on communities doing that. And we saw great, uh, great involvement this last year in 2016. Um, let's see, service-based. I'm glad you mentioned that because I realized I moved away from that page without covering it. So service-based count is using uh, using core service options as a way of counting. And the, the main examples are things like having uh, a stand-down activity or having uh, a count center at a public library or some place that is a common place for persons who are homeless to come. Usually it's several sites. There are very few communities who do only a service-based count. I think it would actually be hard to do a true unsheltered count relying solely on that. Um, most of them do it in conjunction with other pit count efforts. But reasons that people use the service base is because there are a lot of persons who are able to hide uh, but are willing to come in for various types of services. So you're able to, to count them through a service based count, whereas you may not find them during the pit count night. So we often see that. We also see people use service based count uh, because it tends to go over a longer period of time. You can do a service-based count up to seven days. Um, and so communities tend to say, look, go into this, uh, you know, go into the library or go into this uh, food pantry or whatever it be, and they'll do the count during that process while it's open. So uh, I should mention there is, we often get questions about whether or not you can do counts over multiple days. And the answer to that is yes, but you have to have a strong deduplication method. And so that's uh, usually if it's over multiple days, you have to have an, an interview as your core for determining whether or not uh, you've counted persons already. Same with using counts over multiple time periods, right? If you count at 5 p.m. and at 10 p.m., you need to be able to have a way to distinguish those you've already counted. And so using an interview uh, sample or interview based survey is the way to do that. Uh, Jordan, I think I only covered two of the questions. Did I miss one? Uh, no, but here's another one since you're eager. Um, okay. This one is essentially about um, communities who are concerned about improving their methodology so much that they hurt their uh, funding chances. I, I believe you've heard this question before. How would you address those concerns um, to continuums of care who are who are concerned about improving and what that uh, or adding new components and what effect that might have on funding? Yeah, that's a great question. Certainly, uh, certainly valid in our tough competitive uh, time right now. Uh, so when we look at things in our application, we consider methodology changes in the way we look at questions. So if you're able to show methodology changes, we certainly take that into account. We don't want to punish communities that, um, that have changes, specifically increases, because they've changed your methodology. So that your preeminent worry should be getting the right count. And on our end, we do our, uh, our work to make sure we take into account any methodology change to the extent you've documented it so that we can uh, reflect that reality when we look at uh, application and other things. So please focus on getting the right numbers and we'll focus on trying to make sure you're not penalized for that. All right, thanks. <clears throat> so Shira, um, I got a couple questions that came in here around your presentation. Um, a couple things for clarification. One, were background checks conducted for um, your volunteers that weren't associated with a provider? And what was that process? Um, or if not, is, was there some kind of criteria that might uh, screen out potential volunteers? And the other question is if uh, you could clarify, what does this uh, quality assurance person do if there are surveys that are completed incorrectly? Okay, um, so as far as the screening for volunteers, we didn't do any screening other than um, age verification. Um, most of the volunteers that we had um, had either previously participated or they were students um, at the local universities. And like I said, we also had um, 
agency staff and law enforcement. So we didn't really have much concern um, over uh, the people that we sent out to actually volunteer. Um, so that that was ne never an issue that was raised. Um, as far as the QA uh, staff we had, if they were to run into something um, while they're checking the surveys, so one of the reasons why the QA person was um, responsible for keeping the, the volunteers there until they checked it, um, sometimes the volunteers, especially when you're dealing with going out early morning, um, they might have asked the question. It might have just been that they uh, skipped making the actual check mark. And so what the QA person would do would be, um, so did you ask um, John Doe if he, or what race he identified with? And if the person said, oh, yes, I just forgot to mark it, then they can mark it. If the volunteer honestly didn't respond or didn't uh, ask the question or they might have forgotten, then unfortunately we have to leave that particular question blank. But for the most part, um, the, the volunteer was able to give the QA person a response to what um, might have been missing from the survey. And a lot of the times it was a point location that was missing, and so having the volunteer there to um, ask them where exactly they were located when they did the survey was also beneficial. So um, the QA person had a, a major part in making sure that our, our surveys were accurate. Thanks. No okay, Amanda, um, we have a couple questions for you. One is just if you uh, have, an, have an idea what the uh, total population for West Virginia was that came up while you were presenting your numbers, but also um, how uh, for your non-HMIS participants, what info uh, you collect, like a unique ID to compare to your uh, by name list that's generated from HMIS. So how do you know without a name or social security number, et cetera, how do you know if the unsheltered person is already in HMIS and so forth? So um, um, those two. Yep. Okay. So uh, population of West Virginia, uh, 1.88 million people, uh, not huge. And then, uh, of course, uh, the last slide showed the, the breakdown of homeless populations on any given night uh, within the state. Um, as far as the survey data and uh, comparing it to by name list, so everyone, including people who are unsheltered, receive the VI SPDAT. So we're collecting everything that we need to complete a VI SPDAT, including age, um, gender, race, ethnicity, social security number, if they'll give it to us, um, with, in the survey um, of the unsheltered person. So uh, we have all the information we need to get it into HMIS as long as they release that we can put it into HMIS. And part of our uh, script that we train volunteers uh, who are delivering the VI SPDAT through the point in time count says, you know, we're trying to get a, you know, a bead on how many people are homeless in our community and the information that you give us will be fed to a prioritization list so that you can be prioritized for housing resources within your community. So we honestly did not have, I don't think we had anybody last year decline uh, to complete a VI SPDAT survey through the point in time count. Okay, thanks. So the final, the final two questions I have here are, um, first, let's start with one. Some communities have uh, a challenge of recruiting participants, um, especially when they're in very cold, um, high wind chill uh, places. And Amanda, your, your example of the snow uh, made me think about that. But for anybody, um, really, for any of you, do you have any suggestions beyond what you've already said as far as how to uh, adapt to um, extreme sorts of weather and get people out there and counting uh, despite uh, that discouragement? Any thoughts on that? Well, I could take it. Um, this is Amanda. We have not really had too many people who, who don't want to go out. I mean, if you live in the, it sounds crazy, but if you live here, you know what you're getting into in January in West Virginia. Um, so we really haven't had a lot of people 
you know, elderly population, they don't typically volunteer, but we can always find a job for somebody who doesn't want to go out in the, you know, being back at headquarters, uh, being a point uh, contact person, staying, you know, in a service-based location where people are coming in and surveying uh, people inside rather than going out and doing an unsheltered count. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> okay, last question I have here is, it can be for anyone, any one of you, and it regards, I'm kind of combining two questions. Um, it regards how to better coordinate uh, with um, HUD VASH and with runaway and homeless youth um, to get their data as part of the point in time and housing inventory charts, um, and then how yeah how that data is, is gathered and, and used in there. Do do any of you, Shira or or Amanda, have any um, tips for coordinating with VASH or coordinating with runaway and homeless youth and getting them really at the same table? Um, so this is Shira. As far as the HUD VASH program, I can't. I don't. I can't speak directly to that because um, I work uh, outside of the office from the county, so they usually deal with that a little more closely than I do. But as far as homeless youth, um, part of our committee um, members includes a lot of individuals that work with the homeless youth. Like um, our, we have a local covenant house. We have the school board um, representatives. And so um, they're really the ones that give a voice to the youth population. And um, their outreach workers really um, help us target locations. So us being in South Florida on the coast, a lot of our youth are out on the beach um, areas on the coast. So a lot of times when we're trying to target the youth population, we go out to those areas. And so um, our the way we really target the youth population is to make sure that we have the agencies that work with the homeless youth and the at-risk youth um, around the table. So I can take the VA piece of it. I'm glad Shira took the, the youth piece of it. We, like I said in my presentation, we don't have a really good working relationship with our youth providers. We, we actually only have one runaway and homeless youth provider within our COC. And, and working with our homeless ed liaisons has been a challenge. Uh, but I can take the VASH piece of it. We actually have three VAMCs within the geography of our continuum of care. So we've really made some inroads with uh, working with our points, our VASH points of contact at each VAMC. So we go directly to the, the VASH coordinator at each VAMC, and we provide them with the bed tally sheet, and we provide them with the surveys. They don't necessarily always return the surveys, but they return the bed tally sheet completely filled out with the demographic information of the people who have VASH vouchers on the night of the point in time count. We really don't need the survey because we're not counting them in the point in time count. We're only counting the VASH on the HIC, but we are getting that information and we're getting it straight from the VASH coordinator at the, the local VA medical center. Jordan, can I add one piece here as well. Of course. We know there's been a challenge understanding who to contact in terms of the youth side. Uh, so what we're going to do in the next couple of weeks, we're going to publish a document that um, I guess connects the COC to any RIDE providers as well as school liaisons. So it's, it's a master contact list. Uh, and it as complete as possible, right? There will still be some gaps, but the goal is to at least provide uh, not just COCs, but also if right providers want to contact their COCs or schools want to, it just gives everyone access to who the primary contact would be. And we're hoping that that uh, will at least answer the question of who should I talk to, and then uh, and then it's still up to communities and providers to reach out to each other. Fantastic, thanks. And I have a comment here from uh, from Kentucky. Uh, saying, which I appreciate, saying that they they send a housing inventory chart form out to each public housing authority that administers HUD VASH, and then they return it in. The key is to get the right contact there that will respond and know what to do. So, 
Um, okay, well, I, that's all the questions I had copied up to this point. Um, let's um, end it there. And we'd like to thank our three presenters, William, uh, Shira, and Amanda. And keep your eye out for these uh, materials to be posted on our website uh, in the upcoming week or so. And uh, like I said, keep your eye out for the resources on uh, youth counts that will come out throughout October, as well as our next webinar uh, in the middle of October on counting youth. Okay, so thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon.